Good evening, and thank you for joining me for another Boring Books for Bedtime. I hope tonight's selection provides all the boredom your busy brain needs to quiet down and let you get some sleep. Before we begin, I'd like to give a special shout out of thanks to some new members of our Patreon family, Tristan, Mike, Stefan, Tim, Kat, Ruth, Carly, Jennifer, and Space Flower. Thank you all so much for supporting this podcast. By becoming members of Patreon, you help us remain 100% listener-supported and ad-free for everyone, and it's very much appreciated. If you're interested in supporting Boring Books for Bedtime and keeping us one of the few ad-free spaces left for relaxation, you'll find a link to Patreon in the show description. You'll also find a link to buymeacoffee.com where you can support us with a one-time tip, no subscription required. I hope you'll take a moment to check them out. Now... Let's read and relax. Find a comfortable spot. Adjust your volume. Take a nice deep breath in. Let it out slowly. And off we go. Tonight... Let's relax with more instruction from a classic of behavior, etiquette, in society, in business, in politics, and at home, by Emily Post, author of Purple and Fine Linen, The Title Market, Woven in the Tapestry, The Flight of a Moth, Letters of a Worldly Godmother, etc., etc., illustrated with private photographs and facsimiles of social forms, first published in 1922 by Funk and Wagnall's Company, New York and London. Let's pick up right where we left off at Chapter 9. Let's begin. Chapter 9 One's position in the community. The choice. First of all, it is necessary to decide what one's personal idea of position is, whether this word suggests merely a social one, comprising a large or an exclusive acquaintance and leadership in social gaiety, or position established upon the foundation of communal consequence which may or may not include great social gaiety. In other words, you who are establishing yourself, either as a young husband or a stranger, would you, if you could have your wish granted by a genie, choose to have the populace look upon you askance and in awe because of your wealth and elegance? Or would you wish to be loved not as a power conferring favors, which belong really to the first picture, but as a fellow being with an understanding heart. The granting of either wish is not a bit beyond the possibilities of anyone. It is merely a question of depositing securities of value in the bank of life. Life whether social or business, is a bank in which you deposit certain funds of character, intellect, and heart, or other funds of egotism, hard-heartedness, and unconcern, or deposit nothing. And the bank honors your deposit and no more. In other words, you can draw nothing out but what you have put in. If your community is to give you admiration and honor, 
It is merely necessary to be admirable and honorable. The more you put in, the more will be paid out to you. It is too trite to put on paper. But it is astonishing, isn't it? How many people who are depositing nothing whatever expect to be paid in admiration and respect. A man of really high position is always a great citizen first and above all. Otherwise, he is a hollow puppet, whether he is a millionaire or has scarcely a dime to bless himself with. In the same way, a woman's social position that is built on sham, vanity, and selfishness is like one of the buildings at an exposition, effective at first sight, but bound when slightly weather-beaten to show stucco and glue. It would be very presumptuous to attempt to tell any man how to acquire the highest position in his community, especially as the answer is written in his heart, his intellect, his altruistic sympathy, and his ardent civic pride. A subject, however, that is not so serious or overawing, and which can perhaps have directions written for it, is the lesser ambition of acquiring a social position. A bride whose family or family-in-law has social position has merely to take that which is hers by inheritance, but a stranger who comes to live in a new place, or one who has always lived in a community but unknown to society, have both to acquire a standing of their own. For example, the bride of good family. The bride of good family need do nothing on her own initiative. After her marriage, when she settles down in her own house or apartment, Everyone who was asked to her wedding breakfast or reception, and even many who were only bidden to the church, call on her. She keeps their cards, enters them in a visiting or ordinary alphabetically indexed blank book, and within two weeks she returns each one of their calls. As it is etiquette for everyone when calling for the first time on a bride, to ask if she is in, the bride, in returning her first calls, should do likewise. As a matter of fact, a bride assumes the intimate visiting list of both her own and her husband's families, whether they call on her or not. By and by, if she gives a general tea or ball, she can invite whom among them she wants to, she should not, however, ask any mere acquaintances of her family to her house until they have first invited her and her husband to theirs. But if she would like to invite intimate friends of her own or of her husband or of her family, there is no valid reason why she should not do so. Usually, when a bride and groom return from their wedding trip, all their personal friends and those of their respective parents give parties for them, and from being seen at one house, they are invited to another. If they go nowhere, they do not lose position, but they are apt to be overlooked until people remember them by seeing them. But it is not at all necessary for young people to entertain in order to be asked out a great deal. They need merely be attractive and have engaging manners to be as popular as heart could wish. But they must make it a point to be considerate of everyone and never fail to take the trouble to go up with a smiling how do you do to every older lady who has been courteous enough to invite them to her house. That is not toadying, it is merely being polite. To go up and gush is a very different matter. 
and to go up and gush over a prominent hostess who has never invited them to her house is toadying and of a very cheap variety. A really well-bred person is as charming as possible to all, but effusive to none, and shows no difference in manner either, to the high or to the lowly, when they are of equally formal acquaintance. The bride who is a stranger, but whose husband is well known in the town to which he brings her, is in much the same position as the bride noted above, in that her husband's friends call on her. She returns their visits, and many of them invite her to their house, but it then devolves upon her to make herself liked. Otherwise, she will find herself in a community of many acquaintances, but no friends. The best ingredients for likableness are a happy expression of countenance, an unaffected manner, and a sympathetic attitude. If she is so fortunate as to possess these attributes, her path will have roses enough. But a young woman with an affected pose and bad or conceited manners will find plenty of thorns. Equally unsuccessful is she with a chip on her shoulder, who coming from New York, for instance, to live in bright meadows, insists upon dragging New York skyscrapers into every comparison with Bright Meadows' new six-storied building. She might better pack her trunks and go back where she came from. Nor should the bride from Bright Meadows who has married a New Yorker flaunt Bright Meadows' standards or customs and tell Mrs. Worldly that she does not approve of a lady's smoking. Maybe she doesn't, and she may be quite right, and she should not under the circumstances smoke herself, but she should not make a display of intolerance, or she too had better take the first train back home, since she is likely to find New York very, very lonely. When new people move into a community, bringing letters of introduction to prominent citizens, they arrive with an already made position, which ranks in direct proportion to the standing of those who wrote the introductions. Since, however, no one but persons of position are eligible to letters of importance, there would be no question of acquiring position which they have, but merely of adding to their acquaintance. As said in another chapter, people of position are people of position the world over, and all the cities strung around the whole globe are like so many chapter houses of a brotherhood, to which letters of introduction open the doors. However, this is off the subject, which is to advise those who have no position or letters how to acquire the former. It is a long and slow road to travel, particularly long and slow, for a man and his wife in a big city. In New York, people could live in the same house for generations, and do and not have their next-door neighbor know them even by sight. But no other city except London is as unaware as that. When people move to a new city or town, it is usually because of business. The husband, at least, makes business acquaintances, but the wife is left alone. The only thing for her to do is to join the church of her denomination and become interested in some activity, not only as an opening wedge to acquaintanceships and possibly intimate friendships, but as an occupation and a respite from loneliness. Her social position is usually gained at a snail's pace, nor should she do anything to hurry it. 
if she is a real person, if she has qualities of mind and heart, if she has charming manners, sooner or later a certain position will come, and in proportion to her eligibility. One of the ladies with whom she works in church, having gradually learned to like her, asks her to her house. Nothing may ever come of this, but another one also inviting her may bring an introduction to a third who takes a fancy to her. This third lady also invites her where she meets an acquaintance she has already made on one of the two former occasions, and this acquaintance in turn invites her. By the time she has met the same people several times, they gradually, one by one, offer to go and see her, or ask her to come and see them. One inviolable rule she must not forget. It is fatal to be pushing or presuming. She must remain dignified always, natural and sympathetic, when anyone approaches her. But she should not herself approach anyone more than halfway. A smile, the more friendly the better, is never out of place, but after smiling she should pass on. If she is asked to go to see a lady, it is quite right to go, but not again until the lady has returned the visit or asked her to her house and if admitted when making a first visit, she should remember not to stay more than twenty minutes at most, since it is always wiser to make others sorry to have her leave than run the risk of having the hostess wonder why her visitor doesn't know enough to go. The outsider enters society by the same path, but it is steeper and longer because there is an outer gate of reputation called they are not people of any position, which is difficult to unlatch, nor is it ever unlatched to those who sit at the gate rattling at the bars or plaintively peering in. The better and the only way, if she has not the key of birth, is through study to make herself eligible. Meanwhile, charitable or civic work will give her interest and occupation, as well as throw her with ladies of good breeding, by association with whom she cannot fail to acquire some of those qualities of manner before which the gates of society always open. When her husband belongs to a club, or perhaps she does too, and the neighbors are friendly, and those of social importance have called on her and asked her to their houses, a newcomer does not have to stand so exactly on the chalk line of ceremony as in returning her first visits and sending out her first invitations. After people have dined with each other several times, it is not at all important to consider whether an invitation is owed or paid several times over. She who is hospitably inclined can ask people half a dozen times to their once if she wants to, and they show their friendliness by coming, nor need visits be paid in alternate order. Once she is really accepted by people, she can be as friendly as she chooses. When Mrs. Oldname calls on Mrs. Stranger the first time, the latter may do nothing but call in return. It would be the height of presumption to invite one of conspicuous prominence until she has first been invited by her. Nor may the strangers ask the old names to dine after being merely invited to a tea. But when Mrs. Oldname asks Mrs. Stranger to lunch, the latter might then invite the former to dinner, 
after which, if they accept, the strangers can continue to invite them on occasion, whether they are invited in turn or not, especially if the strangers are continually entertaining and the old names are not. But on no account must the strangers' parties be arranged solely for the benefit of any particular fashionables. The strangers can also invite to a party any children whom their own children know at school, and Mrs. Stranger can quite properly go to fetch her own children from a party to which their schoolmates invited them. Bachelors, unless they are very well off, are not expected to give parties, nor for that matter are very young couples. All hostesses go on asking single men and young people to their houses, without it ever occurring to them that any return other than politeness should be made. There are many couples, not necessarily in the youngest set either, who are tremendously popular in society, in spite of the fact that they give no parties at all. The Lovejoys, for instance, who are clamored for everywhere, have every attribute except money. With fewer clothes, perhaps, than any fashionable young woman in New York, she can't compete with Mrs. Bobo Gilding or Constance Style for smartness. But, as Mrs. Worldly remarked, what would be the use of Celia Lovejoy's beauty? if it depended upon continual variation in clothes. The only entertaining the Lovejoys ever do is limited to afternoon tea and occasional Welsh rarebit suppers, but they return every bit of hospitality shown them by helping to make a party go wherever they are. Both are amusing. Both are interesting. Both do everything well. They can't afford to play cards for money, but they both play a very good game, and the table is delighted to carry them, or they play at the same table against each other. This, by the way, is another illustration of the conduct of a gentleman. If young Lovejoy played for money he would win undoubtedly in the long run, because he plays unusually well. But to use card playing as a means of making money would be contrary to the ethics of a gentleman, just as playing for more than can be afforded turns a game into gambling. The sense of whom to invite with whom is one of the most important and elusive points in social knowledge. The possession or lack of it is responsible more than anything else for the social success of one woman and the failure of another. And as it is almost impossible without advice for any stranger anywhere to know which people like or dislike each other, the would-be hostess must either by means of natural talent or more likely by trained attention read the signs of liking or prejudice, much as a woodsman reads a message in every broken twig or turned leaf. One who can read expression perceives at a glance the difference between friendliness and polite aloofness. When a lady is unusually silent, strictly impersonal in conversation, and entirely unapproachable, something is not to her liking. The question is, what? Or usually, whom? The greatest blunder possible would be to ask her what the matter is. The cause of annoyance is probably that she finds someone distasteful, and it should not be hard for one whose faculties are not asleep to discover the offender, and if possible separate them, 
or at least never ask them together again. Chapter 10 Cards and Visits Who was it that said, in the Victorian era probably, and a man of course, the only mechanical tool ever needed by a woman is a hairpin? He might have added that with a hairpin and a visiting card, she is ready to meet most emergencies. Although the principal use of a visiting card, at least the one for which it was originally invented, to be left as an evidence of one person's presence at the house of another, is going gradually out of ardent favor in fashionable circles, its usefulness seems to keep a nicely adjusted balance. In New York, for instance, the visiting card has entirely taken the place of the written note of invitation to informal parties of every description. Messages of condolence or congratulation are written on it. It is used as an endorsement in the giving of an order. It is even tacked on the outside of express boxes. The only employment of it which is not as flourishing as formerly is its being left in quantities and with frequency at the doors of acquaintances. This will be explained further on. The card of a lady is usually from about two and three quarters to three and one half inches wide by two to two and three quarter inches high but there is no fixed rule. The card of a young girl is smaller and more nearly square in shape, about two inches high by two and one half or two and five eighths inches long, depending upon the length of the name. A gentleman's card is long and narrow, from two and seven eighths to three and one quarter inches long and from one and one quarter to one and five-eighths inches high. All visiting cards are engraved on white, unglazed Bristol board, which may be of medium thickness or thin as one fancies. A few years ago, there was a fad for cards as thin as writing paper, but one seldom sees them in America now. The advantage of a thin card is that a greater quantity may be carried easily. The engraving most in use today is shaded block. Script is seldom seen, but it is always good form, and so is plain block. But with the exception of Old English, all ornate lettering should be avoided. All people who live in cities should have the address in the lower right corner, engraved in smaller letters than the name. In the country, addresses are not important, as everyone knows where everyone else lives. People who have town and country houses usually have separate cards. The economically inclined can have several varieties of cards printed from one plate. The card should vary somewhat in size in order to center the wording. The personal card is in a measure an index of one's character. A fantastic or garish note in the type effect, in the quality or shape of the card, betrays a lack of taste in the owner of the card. It is not customary for a married man to have a club address on his card, and it would be serviceable only in giving a card of introduction to a business acquaintance under social rather than business circumstances, or in paying a formal call upon a political or business associate. Unmarried men often use no other address than that of a club, especially if they live in bachelor's quarters. But young men who live at home can use their home address. To be impeccably correct, initials should not be engraved on a visiting card. 
A gentleman's card should read, Mr. John Hunter Titherington Smith, but since names are sometimes awkwardly long, and it is the American custom to cling to each and every one given in baptism, he asserts his possessions by representing each one with an initial, and engraves his cards, Mr. John H. T. Smith, or Mr. J. H. Titherington Smith, as suits his fancy. So although, according to high authorities, he should drop a name or two and be Mr. Hunter Smith or Mr. Titherington Smith, it is very likely that to the end of time the American man, and necessarily his wife, who must use the name as he does, will go on cherishing initials. And a widow, no less than a married woman, should always continue to use her husband's Christian name, or his name and another initial engraved on her cards. She is Mrs. John Hunter Titherington Smith, or to compromise, Mrs. J. H. Titherington Smith, but she is never Mrs. Sarah Smith, at least not anywhere in good society. In business and in legal matters, a woman is necessarily addressed by her own Christian name because she uses it in her own signature, but no one should ever address an envelope except from a bank or a lawyer's office, Mrs. Sarah Smith. When a widow's son who has the name of his father marries, the widow has senior added to her own name. Or if she is the head of the family, she very often omits all Christian names and has her card engraved Mrs. Smith, and the son's wife calls herself Mrs. John Hunter Smith. Smith is not a very good name as an example since no one could very well claim the distinction of being the Mrs. Smith. It, however, illustrates the point. For the daughter-in-law to continue to use a card with Junior on it, when her husband no longer uses Junior on his, is a mistake made by many people. A wife always bears the name of her husband, to have a man and his mother use cards engraved respectively, Mr. J. H. Smith and Mrs. J. H. Smith, and the son's wife a card engraved, Mrs. J. H. Smith, Jr., would announce to whomever the three cards were left upon that Mr. and Mrs. Smith and their daughter-in-law had called. The cards of a young girl after she is sixteen have always Miss before her name, which must be her real and never a nickname, Miss Sarah Smith, not Miss Sally Smith. The fact that a man's name has Junior added at the end in no way takes the place of Mr. His card should be engraved, Mr. John Hunter Smith, Jr., and his wife's, Mrs. John Hunter Smith, Jr. Some people have the Jr. written out, J-U-N-I-O-R. It is not spelled with a capital J if written in full. A boy puts Mr. on his cards when he leaves school though many use cards without Mr. on them while in college. A doctor or a judge or a minister or a military officer have their cards engraved with the abbreviation of their title, Dr. Henry Gordon, Judge Horace Rush, the Reverend William Good, Colonel Thomas Doyle. The double card reads... Dr. and Mrs. Henry Gordon, Honorable and Mrs., etc. A woman who has divorced her husband retains the legal as well as the social right to use her husband's full name, in New York State at least. 
Usually she prefers, if her name was Alice Green, to call herself Mrs. Green Smith, not Mrs. Alice Smith, and on no account Mrs. Alice Green, unless she wishes to give the impression that she was the guilty one in the divorce. That very little children should have visiting cards is not so silly as might at first thought be supposed. To acquire perfect manners and those graces of deportment that Lord Chesterfield so ardently tried to instill into his son, training cannot begin early enough, since it is through lifelong familiarity with the niceties of etiquette that much of the distinction of those to the manner born is acquired. Many mothers think it good training for children to have their own cards, which they are taught not so much to leave upon each other after parties as to send with gifts upon various occasions. At the rehearsal of a wedding, the tiny twin flower girls came carrying their wedding present for the bride between them, to which they had themselves attached their own small visiting cards. One card was bordered and engraved in pink, and the other bordered and engraved in blue, and the address on each read, Chez Maman. And in going to see a new baby cousin, each brought a small 1830 bouquet and sent to their aunt their cards, on which, after seeing the baby, one had printed, He is very little, and the other, It has a red face. This shows that if modern society believes in beginning social training in the nursery, it does not believe in hampering a child's natural expression. The double card, reading Mr. and Mrs., is sent with a wedding present, or with flowers to a funeral, or with flowers to a debutante, and is also used in paying formal visits. The card on which a debutante's name is engraved under that of her mother is used most frequently when no coming out entertainment has been given for the daughter. Her name on her mother's card announces wherever it is left that the daughter is grown and eligible for invitations. In the same way, a mother may leave her son's card with her own upon any of her own friends, especially upon those likely to entertain for young people. This is the custom if a young man has been away at school and college for so long that he has not a large acquaintance of his own. It is, however, correct under any circumstances when formally leaving cards to leave those of all sons and daughters who are grown. The PPC Card This is merely a visiting card, whether of a lady or a gentleman, on which the initials PPC, pour prendre congé, to take leave, are written in ink in the lower left corner. This is usually left at the door or sent by mail to acquaintances when one is leaving for the season or for good. It never takes the place of a farewell visit when one has received a special courtesy, nor is it in any sense a message of thanks for a special kindness. In either of these instances, a visit should be paid or a note of farewell and thanks written. In cities where there is no social register or other printed society list, one notifies acquaintances of a change of address by mailing a visiting card. Cards are also sent with a temporary address written in ink when one is in a strange city and wishes to notify friends where one is stopping. It is also quite correct 
for a lady to mail her card with her temporary address written on it to any gentleman whom she would care to see and who she is sure would like to see her. When not intending to go to a tea or a wedding reception, the invitation to which did not have RSVP on it and require an answer, one should mail cards to the hostess so as to arrive on the morning of the entertainment. To a tea given for a debutante, cards are enclosed in one envelope and addressed Mrs. Gilding, Miss Gilding, OO Fifth Avenue, New York. For a wedding reception, cards are sent to Mr. and Mrs. Gilding, the mother and father of the bride, and another set of cards sent to Mr. and Mrs. Worthy, the bride and bridegroom. The Visit of Empty Form Not so many years ago, a lady or gentleman, young girl or youth, who failed to pay her or his party call, after having been invited to Mrs. Social Leader's Ball, was left out of her list when she gave her next one for the old-fashioned hostess kept her visiting list with the precision of a bookkeeper in a bank. Everyone's credit was entered or cancelled, according to the presence of her or his cards in the card receiver. Young people who liked to be asked to her house were apt to leave an extra one at the door on occasion, so that there should not be among the missing when the new list for the season was made up, especially as the more important old ladies were very quick to strike a name off, but seldom, if ever, known to put one back. But about twenty years ago, the era of informality set in and has been gaining ground ever since. In certain cities, old-fashioned hostesses, it is said, exclude delinquents. But New York is too exotic and intractable, and the too exacting hostess is likely to find her tapestried rooms rather empty, while the younger world of fashion flocks to the crystal-fountained ballroom of the new spendeasy westerns. And then, too, Life holds so many other diversions and interests for the very type of youth, which of necessity is the vital essence of all social gaiety. Society can have distinction and dignity without youth, but not gaiety. The country with its outdoor sports, its freedom from exacting conventions, has gradually deflected the interest of the younger fashionables, until at present they care very little whether Mrs. Top Lofty and Mrs. Social Leader ask them to their balls or not. They are glad enough to go, of course, but they don't care enough for invitations, to pay dull visits, and to live up to the conventions of manners that old-fashioned hostesses demand. And as these rebels are invariably the most attractive and the most eligible youths, it has become almost an issue. A hostess must, in many cases, either invite none but older people and the few young girls and men whose mothers have left cards for them, or ignore convention and invite the rebels. In trying to find out where the present indifference started, many ascribe it to Bobo Gilding, to whom entering a great drawing room was more suggestive of the daily afternoon tea ordeal of his early nursery days than a voluntary act of pleasure. He was long ago one of the first to rebel against old Mrs. Toplofty's exactions of party calls by saying he did not care in the least whether his great-aunt Jane Toplofty invited him to her stodgy old ball or not. And then Lucy Wellborn, the present Mrs. Bobo Gilding, did not care much to go either, 
if none of her particular men friends were to be there. Little she cared to dance the cotillion with old Colonel Bluffington, or to go to supper with that odious Hector Newman. And so, beginning first with a few gilded youths, then including young society, the habit has spread until the obligatory paying of visits by young girls and men has almost joined the once universal day at home as belonging to a past age. Do not understand by this that visits are never paid on other occasions. Visits to strangers, visits of condolence, and of other courtesies are still paid, quite as punctiliously as ever, but within the walls of society itself, the visit of formality is decreasing. One might almost say that in certain cities, society has become a family affair. Its walls are as high as ever, higher perhaps to outsiders, but among its own members, such customs as keeping visiting lists and having days at home, or even knowing who owes a visit to whom, is not only unobserved, but is unheard of. But because punctilious card leaving, visiting, and days at home have gone out of fashion in New York, is no reason why these really important observances should not be or are not in the height of fashion elsewhere. Nor, on the other hand, must anyone suppose, because the young fashionables in New York pay few visits and never have days at home, that they are a bit less careful about the things which they happen to consider essential to good breeding. The best type of young men pay few, if any, party calls, because they work and they exercise, and whatever time is left over, if any, is spent in their club or at the house of a young woman, not tete-a-tete, -tete, but invariably playing bridge. The Sunday afternoon visits that the youth of another generation used always to pay are unknown in this, because every man who can spends the weekend in the country. It is scarcely an exaggeration to say that not alone men, but many young married women of highest social position, except to send with flowers or wedding presents, do not use a dozen visiting cards a year. But there are circumstances when even the most indifferent to social obligations must leave cards. Etiquette absolutely demands that one leave a card within a few days after taking a first meal in a lady's house, or if one has for the first time been invited to lunch or dine with strangers, it is inexcusably rude not to leave a card upon them whether one accepted the invitation or not. One must also unfailingly return a first call, even if one does not care for the acquaintance. Only a real cause can excuse the affront to an innocent stranger that the refusal to return a first call would imply. If one does not care to continue the acquaintance, one need not pay a second visit. Also, a card is always left with a first invitation. Supposing Miss Philadelphia takes a letter of introduction to Mrs. Newport. Mrs. Newport, inviting Miss Philadelphia to her house, would not think of sending her invitation without also leaving her card. Good form demands that a visit be paid before issuing a first invitation. Sometimes a note of explanation is sent, asking that the formality be waived, but it is never disregarded, except in the case of an invitation from an older lady to a young girl. 
Mrs. Worldly, for instance, who has known Jim Smartlington always, might, instead of calling on Mary Smith, to whom his engagement is announced, write her a note asking her to lunch or dinner. But in inviting Mrs. Great Lake of Chicago, she would leave her card with her invitation at Mrs. Great Lake's hotel. It seems scarcely necessary to add that anyone not entirely heartless must leave a card on or send flowers to an acquaintance who has suffered a recent bereavement. One should also leave cards of inquiry or send flowers to sick people. Books on etiquette seem agreed that sending an invitation does not cancel the obligation of paying a visit, which may be technically correct, but fashionable people who are in the habit of lunching or dining with each other two or three times a season pay no attention to visits whatever. Mrs. Norman calls on Mrs. Gilding. Mrs. Gilding invites the Normans to dinner. They go. A short time afterward, Mrs. Norman invites the Gildings, or the Gildings very likely again invite the Normans. Some evening at all events, the Gildings dine with the Normans. Some day, if Mrs. Gilding happens to be leaving cards, she may leave them at the Normans, or she may not. Some people leave cards, almost like the hares in a paper chase. Others seldom, if ever, do. Except on the occasions mentioned in the paragraph before this, or unless there is an illness, a death, a birth, or a marriage, people in society invite each other to their houses and don't leave cards at all, nor do they ever consider whose turn it is to invite whom. And with that, I think we'll end this evening's reading from Etiquette by Emily Post. I confess, I kind of missed the tradition of visiting cards. Some of them were very pretty and it just seems more fun than a business card. If you'd like to read this work for yourself and learn everything you ever wanted to know about etiquette, as always, you'll find a link to a free ebook from Project Gutenberg in the show description. If you'd like to connect, suggest a boring book you'd like to hear read, or request more from when we've already started, you can drop me an email via our website, www.boringbookspod.com. It's always a pleasure to hear from you. Thank you so much for joining me for this evening's reading. Until our next boring book, good night. <laughs>